Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. Father, once again, we bow before your word this evening. We recognize its sole authority in our lives for all faith and for all practice this evening. We recognize its eternal nature this evening. And Lord, that we recognize that it's what we need to base our lives on. It's course correcting for us. And so, Lord, as we look at your word again this evening, if we need our course corrected, we pray you speak to us through your word this evening. We pray that you would encourage your people by it, that you would direct us by it, teach us by it, conform us to your image by your word this evening. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless you. You can be seated this evening. So where I promised you we were to the last part of all the bad stuff. And um, I really believe we are. So that's good news. So um, come back next week and there'll be a happy sermon. So <laughs> next <laughs> Next week, you're in for a good, happy sermon. Uh, uh, this week, just hold on. So there you go. Because Jude here, Jude ha is, has made his case now. He's been making his case in all the previous 13 verses, and now he's lowering the boom at this point. Now he's gone through all of their stuff, and now he's just pronouncing, declaring, proclaiming judgment is sure and swift coming for these people that have been such a disruption in this church that he's writing to here. And so Jude once again then references this book called uh, Enoch, and that uh, again, is very well known to his congregation. First century Jews would have been very well aware and familiar with this book and looked at it authoritatively as part of their traditions. Uh, and so we don't, I, I don't know that Jude is giving a full-throated endorsement of the, of the infallibility and the inspiration of Enoch. I don't know that he's doing that. But what he's doing is he's taking out of this book what he believes applies to these people that he's writing against and saying this applies to them wholly and solely to these people here. And he's making it applicable to them and he's doing it in a way that his congregation knows exactly what he's doing and the reference material that he's using then. And so he goes back and he's talking about then, he says, now this prophecy has to do with God coming back for the judgment and bringing thousands, some versions say tens of thousands of holy ones, of these angels with him to to do this judgment that's going to happen. I don't know exactly what the angels are going to do. He doesn't, Jude doesn't tell us that. I don't know if, they're, I mean, they're either going to do one of two things. They're either going to uh, help execute the judgment as angels we see in the Old Testament do uh, on occasion. God sends angels to do judgment then that he's proclaimed on people. We've seen that before. Uh, in the Old Testament, or they're going to be there as a witness to the judgment. It's not like God needs their help. God can just speak a word and judgment's done, right? 
And so God doesn't need their help. So they're either there to do his bidding in the judgment or they're there as a witness to the judgment. Either way, there's a courthouse coming. God's the judge. Witnesses will be in place and the condemned will be there as well. This, um, I have to be honest with you, this is a very emphatic portion of Scripture that is a little scary to read, honestly. If you can go over these words over and over again and not get a, just a little twinge in your spirit, you are too safe. All right, you are just too, and I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a wrong way, but we need to be aware God takes some things seriously, and we don't always take the same thing seriously that God takes seriously, and Jude's about to bring that out, and that's why this speaks to us today. It's why it's such a powerful word, even to you and I, uh, today listen to what he says this judgment is coming to these people and what so what's the nature of this judgment here's the nature of this judgment the word ungodly is used four times in this one passage here right listen to it again Even to execute judgment upon all uh, mark that all because all is used four times as well the, so this is going to be all inclusive all encompassing right to all to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds uh, which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. gee i wonder what he's talking about Maybe it's ungodliness. I don't know, right? Seems like he's trying to drive a point home. And it's this ungodliness that he is writing about in this. And, but then also that it's all going to be brought to bear. That it's not just the ungodly. It's everything that the uh, ungodly have done. It's not like they're going to get away with some things and be judged for other things. It's all of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way. All of it, Jude's pointing out. It's this all-inclusive. No one there is going to get off and no one's going to get by in this judgment. It's an all-encompassing judgment that's going to not only all take all-encompassing of all sinners and all ungodly and all the unsaved, but of every deed and every thought and every word that's been uttered in an ungodly way. There's not going to be any hung juries in this judgment. There won't be any not guilty verdicts. There won't be any biased DAs to let him off with a slap on the wrist. While justice here, as in Jude's day, is, is kind of a hit and miss proposition sometimes. There is a sure thing. Their justice is going to be sure. There's not going to be any haves and have-nots. There's not going to be the elites and the non-elites that we complain about so much where the elites seem to get away with everything and anything and the underprivileged uh, uh, sometimes get to play the, the victim card and everybody in the middle has to just go to jail. No, not at this judgment. At this judgment... Everybody is going to be held accountable for every sin. And not only are they going to be held accountable, they're going to be held responsible. All of the ungodly will be held accountable and will be held responsible. And there'll be no finger pointing. There'll be no casting blame. 
There'll be no standing before the throne of God and saying, well, this, my life will make a lot better sense once my father gets here or my mom gets here or the bully in school or the, or the other person down the street or the drug dealer who got me hooked or, or whoever it was. There'll be no finger pointing in this courtroom because we'll be there alone. There'll be no need for witnesses to be called because the books will have already been opened and all of the deeds have been recorded. And the charges read out one by one in just this judgment. This judgment is going to be, it's going to be sure. As sure as the chair that you're sitting in right now, as soon as the moon rising tonight, as soon as, as sure as the sun coming up tomorrow morning, as sure as this is Palm Sunday and the next Sunday we celebrate an empty tomb, as sure as that, at this judgment, every ungodly person will be held accountable and responsible for every ungodly deed, every ungodly thought, every ungodly word will be brought open. It will be sure. There'll be no mistakes made. There'll be no typos. There'll be no forgots. None of that at this judgment. Everything has been recorded and unless washed out by the blood of Jesus, it will be brought out and it will be judged and it will be condemned and paid for eternally separated from God. It'll be sure, it'll be just. We don't serve an unjust God. One of his perfections is just. That he will, he will bring just the right amount. It'll be sure, it'll be just, and it'll be commensurate. With everything that's done, with everything that's brought out, the judgment will be commensurate with the sin that's due. The one who just kind of lollygagged through life and and just didn't do what they were supposed to. Uh, they're not going to have the same judgment as Hitler and Stalin, but they're going to be judged all the same. They'll be in hell all the same. But it'll be commensurate to theirs. That's what the Bible teaches. And even the lightest part of hell is not a hell we want anything to do with. Even the lightest judgment is not one that anybody wants any part of if they knew anything about it. Not only will it be sure, not only will it be just, not only will it be commensurate, but it'll be final. There's no appellate court from this judgment. There's no higher authority to go to. There's no Supreme Court where you can go and plead your case and, and maybe get ideology to interfere and get an unjust judge. No, this one is going to be sure and just and commiserate and final. And once that judgment is passed, eternity just begins. Eternity just begins unending eternity time after time after time after time with no end in sight what kind of sins warrant this kind of judgment you say man that's kind of harsh and it is but it's just it's just what kind of sins is he talking about? Well, Jude brings out basically two kinds of sins. Uh, two, I shouldn't say two kinds. There's only one kind, sin. Two categories, I should say. Um, they're ungodly deeds and ungodly speech. Did you notice how many times there he mentioned things dealing with language 
as he goes through that list of things that he's talking about there, listen again to what he, he says here. Of all the ungodly deeds which they have done. So there's ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way. And notice that connecting word. We're talking about something a little different now. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That just begin so we're talking about harsh deeds ungodly deeds that are done and then some stupid stuff some stupid people have said that they shouldn't have said about god how do you think all the how do you think all the trouble started in this church that's how it started it started with talking. It started with speech. It started with, well, I don't know if I believe that. I just don't know if I accept that. Well, I think I believe something else. Well, I heard this differently, and I had it explained, and I had a revelation, and I had a dream, and blah, 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 blah. And I had to, remember, by dreaming, remember that verse that we have already gone over, that these men, by dreaming, and I had a dream, and I had a vision, and God spoke to me, and he said, that's not what he said. And it turns out, apparently he said what he meant. Sins of language. He goes, of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then he goes to even further, and he begins to categorize these people who are in the church. Uh, these are grumblers. Fault finders following after their oh, this uh, from the first two. How many had a name already picked in your head? <laughs> just from grumblers and fault finders, how many had a face just go boom? Whoa, right? Following after their own lust, they speak arrogantly. Sins of speech. They speak arrogantly. Flattering people for the sake of gaining attention. All of that having to do with just speech. And it has tore up the church. And Jude is writing them saying, somebody's going to answer for this. Somebody is going to answer for the dismay, that, for, the, for the disruption and for all the stuff that's happened in this church that they started by flapping their lips when they shouldn't have. All of these things. The two are intermingled, almost uh, just like one's just as bad as the other. Imagine that. Uh, apparently, God isn't as fond of free speech as we seem to be. You know? We tend to say anything we want to say. Oh, free speech. I've got a right. I got, you can't trample on my rights. Don't tread on me. I'm going to get my little snake flag out. And you can't tread on me. I can say what I want to. Uh, apparently, God doesn't feel that way. Because he's going to be bringing a lot of people to account for things they said. For trouble they caused by speech they used in the church here. Here's some things that they said. Harsh things spoken about God. These are offensive things spoken against God. Harsh, offensive things that are spoken against God is what these things are. See, he's not as good as um, he claims to be. Why would he let you go through that if, if he was so good? Right? Why, why is God letting you go? Well, doesn't he love you? I bet that just grates on God's nerves. That kind of stuff. Uh, God, who went to the cross for you, and now you're going to say he's not good? Because we go through some things when he said, you're going to go through some things. But I've overcome the world. I'm going to go with it through you. Listen, one of the most comforting things you can tell somebody who's facing the most difficult time of their life is this. We, know what, we have a God who knows what it is to lose a son. We have a God who knows what it is to die, to go through death himself. 
There's nothing that we haven't gone through. There's no physical ailment. There's none of these things. There's no temptation known to man that our God hasn't gone through at first. That's how good our God is. And now because we go, oh, don't you think God is being a little rough on you? No. God's bringing us through. God's promise he's going to bring us through. Harsh things spoken against God. Then he says, grumblers. Well, just your basic murmurer. Just a murmur. I don't like the way the seats are. I don't like the color of the walls. Why do we have to have this? Why has that got to be this way? It's just grumblers and murmurers. Apparently, God's not a fan. Fault finders, just complainers. Complainers especially about their lot in life is is what the Greek would say about that. Just their lot, well, it's not my fault. Well, it's not, I'm here because somebody else. I I never got a break. I I just had to do it all by myself. I'm just, I'm just, I'm self-made and I didn't tend to make much. This fault finding all the time. Well, nobody ever helped me. I, nobody ever lifted a hand to help me. Everybody else got all the breaks and, and all of these things. Just complain and complain and complain. If you've ever been around somebody like that, sooner or later, it just grates on your nerves. Imagine God with all the help of heaven saying, Lord Jesus, <laughs> Cam, the, what are, got all the help of heaven ready to go if you'll just humble yourself and get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on Jesus just these complainers and following after their own lust. These people that are, are just following after their own cravings, their own desires, their own sinful desires. It, even if it isn't a sexual or, or something, it's just, I've got to have this or I won't be happy. I've got to have that or I won't be happy. Their own lust. I've got to have a new car so I can't afford to pay my tithes. Because it's the new car smell I'm addicted to. It's the new clothes. I'll never forget, Dad was preaching on stewardship one month. He's done it for 30 years here. And, and, and the, the, the year that he came in and said, every, every, everybody ties. It's just some people come in with, Ties that paid for the car, ties that paid for the clothes. And, and so actually they're, they're riding around in stolen ties. And they're wearing stolen ties. And they're, they're eating stolen pie, ties, pies from Domino's, from, you know, the pizza pie. And because they're paying all for that with their tithe. Why? Because they're craving that and the, their desires. And they're following after their own lust. Whatever they're lusting for in life. And then he says they speak arrogantly. I love this one. You look up that word and it's oversized, swollen, and boastful. You ever know anybody who's that describes their speech? Well, I've done this and I've done that. Doesn't matter what you've done, they've done it twice. Right? They've done it twice. They have done it better. They did it faster. They did it with less money. And, uh, they, they, and, and furthermore, they remember all about it. And, and they can fill in the minutest detail. All you got to do is tell them a little bit about your experience first. And they'll be able to f take that and just fill in the details. Then Everything they've done and where they've been and all the grand things that they've done and they've accomplished in their life. And, and they probably would have got farther in life if somebody else other than themselves had noticed all of that stuff that they did. 
arrogant, oversized, swollen, boastful, and then flattery for the sake of personal advantage. Just this insincere and undue favor for personal profit. That's what that is. This, this. Ins- you don't mean it. They don't mean it. They're just trying to get you on their side. They're just trying to get your vote. They're just trying to get your confidence. They're just trying to get your, you to like them. They're just trying to get some kind of personal profit out of this deal. And so they'll flatter and they'll spit. And they'll say, oh my, don't you look good. And oh, don't you this and don't you that. And, and all of this is just, that's what they were doing in Jude's time. They've come into that church and they've got a hold of the leaders. And, oh, man, you just speak so eloquently. And you, oh, it's just resonated with me. And, and all, just why? For personal profit. So they can get in and they can start gaining an advantage and they can get influence over them. And so here's my question How did we go from talking at the first part of jude you remember way back this is sermon number seven so six yeah six sermons ago when we started talking about this how did we go from talking about a church steeped in and with these leaders in gross immorality and sexual lasciviousness, which is what Jude started with, and he's ending with, they're saying the wrong things, and God's coming to judge them for it. Because if you only read verse 14 through 17, you go, man, that is a little harsh. I mean, yeah, there is, speech probably needs to be cleaned up. But if you miss the whole first part of it, where it's all the gross immorality and sexual lasciviousness and the, oh, don't forget, denying the divinity of Christ, uh, the divine authority of Christ and denying the apostolic faith that's been passed. Remember all those sermons that have been passed and all of that's passed. And now he's down to just saying they're grumblers, they're murmurers, they're fault finders. They're, they're just all these sins of speech and ungodly deeds in an ungodly way from an ungodly people and God's bringing the hammer. How did we go from that to this? It almost seems like it's kind of flip-flop, doesn't it? Like we should have started with sins of speech and gone to ungodly deeds and wound up with sexual immorality and, and gross lasciviousness and, and all of that. There, it almost seems like it, it kind of got wrote backwards, doesn't it? Except that, you know, when you read 14 through 17, if it shocks you, it's probably a wake-up call to our own culture. Because, boy, don't we have a lot of murmurs. A lot of complainers and a lot of backbiters and a lot of fault finders and a lot of people following after that they want what they lust after and their own arrogant speech and their own flattery for the sake of gaining style it's almost like it's written for our own generation It really is a wake-up call about how lightly, if it shocks us, how lightly we regard what Christ takes seriously. You know, it's hard to embarrass this culture, isn't it? It's hard to embarrass this culture. You see them on the news at night. You see them on TV. So <laughs> don't mention about the movies. But it's hard to embarrass them. The things that they walk around in, the things that they uh, model in, the things that they take pictures of, the things that they just, um, the things that they yell on, on college campuses now and universities and, and just all of these, it's hard to, 
Can you imagine a couple generations ago, their, their mom and dad's not come getting them and say, if that's how you're going to act, I'm not paying for this school. You're coming back home and digging ditches. You're not going to embarrass me like that. Apparently, higher education is not your thing, right? And so you're going to come home, get your hands greasy, get some blisters on there, see if we can get a little higher education that way. It's hard to embarrass this culture. I bet Jude thought the same way. What does it take for these people to be embarrassed about what they're saying? What does it take for these congregation, these church members, what does it take for them to just be shocked and say, whoa, did that just come out of my mouth? Just look at speech in our lifetime. Look at what the movies used to be rated and what they get away with being rated now. Some of you that remember movies back, uh, Sister Mary was telling me, she remembers they used to always start with a cartoon because of my Woe Camel cartoon uh, a couple weeks ago. Woe Camel, that, uh, they, used to, they did, they used to start with a cartoon. And now there's really nothing funny going on, even in the things called comedies. There's so much stuff that, that would embarrass the, the, the generation that's already gone. Sins that Jesus takes seriously, we ought to take seriously. Things that he regards as sacred, we need to take sacred. We started out saying if the apostles believed it, then we should believe it. That's how we started out, remember, about the apostolic faith. And what it seems like Jude's coming down to is something like this. If we talk about it, we'll soon live it. The way we talk will eventually turn into the way we live. Did, did you get that? The way that we talk, will eventually turn into the way we live. And it's what happened in Jude's church. They came in, and the way they started talking turned into the way they started living. And it tore the church up. The way they started to grumble, and the way they started to find fault, and then they started finding fault with God himself. The harsh thing spoken against him. Because once you can say harsh things against the pastor and about, got, about the other believers and about God's church and his bride, it's not a very far step to say harsh things against God himself. Once you get into the habit of speaking harsh things, the only, the only question is who's the next target? That's the only question. Once that becomes the habit of life, of speaking harsh things, the only question is who's going to be next in the target line? And eventually you run out of targets if you're in a church setting because the big target, just like Satan, is God. Harsh things spoken against him. And the whole time not knowing he's recording all of it in his book. In his book, every word, every phrase, every instant, nothing's left out, nothing's left undone, nothing's misinterpreted, nothing's misconstrued, nothing's taken out of context, nothing, nothing, nothing. And it's all going to be brought out because the way we talk will eventually start to live. And that's what Jude ends this portion with. This warning about guard what comes out of your mouth. Jesus is it this way, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And eventually spoken enough the hands start to do 
okay? Out of the heart, it begins there. And then when you feel comfortable enough to speak it, eventually you feel good enough to do it, to talk it. It's just this constant process of rationalization all the way down. And that's where Jude is calling him up short and saying all the stuff at the beginning all started with just talking rock in God's house. Just for the wrong intentions and the wrong things. All that stuff of disregarding the apostolic faith and divine authority and all of that all started with saying harsh things. Started with murmuring. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Started with murmuring and Grumbling, fault finding, and flattery for the sake of personal profit, and arrogant speech. All of it wound up in this church that's in crisis. Absolute crisis because of this. Well, next week will be a very happy sermon. (laughs) Listen, if there's something, we like to joke, we like to have fun. And I believe God likes to have fun. I think God has a tremendous sense of humor. I really do. I think the reason humanity has a sense of humor is because we're made in his image. And he has a sense of humor. Understand? But I also think we need to be careful how we speak in God's house to God's people and to God himself and to the world out there. Because when we speak to the world out there, we're representing something other than ourselves. We are representing the king of kings. And God, not such a big fan of free speech, apparently. We just need to keep that in mind. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. It is a hard word, admittedly. It's not a fun word to preach. I don't think it's probably a fun word to hear. But it is your word. And it's a necessary word that we need to come back to time and again because it's a course correction for us. That's what your word does. It teaches and it reproves and it guides and it encourages and it builds up. And Lord, tonight, even though this hasn't been a yip yip hooray word it's been a true word because it's been your word and I ask you tonight just to help us would you look into our hearts would you just look into our hearts we don't want any of that stuff even beginning with us we don't want any of it even to start in our own lives and in our own hearts much less out of our mouths we want to be edifying we want to be building up we want to be right with you and with each other and with those around us so Lord would you help us with that Help us as we spend a few minutes around this altar this evening and have you search us and know us and bring us to the end of ourselves. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.